All right, we've been going through the book of Genesis, which I hope you guys have been enjoying. I've been enjoying studying it because I see a lot of myself in there. Uh, recently, we've gone over some interesting things like the Tower of Babel, where God confused the languages of the world and sent people out. It was basically the big man plan where we're going to make a stairway to heaven. We're going to make our way to God, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. And it, it basically sounds like the world today. It's no different. It's a matter of self first, self on the throne, and uh, get as many people to orbit you as you possibly can. Uh, that's the man plan. That's the flesh of all human beings. And we saw that the Lord came and confound their languages and sent them out. Last week, we saw Abraham and Sarah. We're kind of taking a turn as we go from chapter 11 into 12 and forward. The scripture has been concentrating on these major events and been going through thousands of years. And now it slows down and it begins to zoom in on people. And first there's Abraham or Abram as we know him because his name gets changed and how he meets Sarai and they get married and where he's from and who he's a descendant of. And so we've been given all of his background and how God came to him one day, this idol worshiping Gentile and said, I want you and spoke to him. And it says that Abraham believed what God said and it was counted to him for righteousness. And what that means is, Abraham is the father of all the faithful. We have not heard anybody respond to God, and we've never seen God appear to anyone before, except for Abram in this way. And so Abram becomes the father of the faithful, and we know him to be the father of all of the Jewish nations. In fact, they're very proud to say that they're related to Abraham. Although if you called him a, a Gentile and an idol worshiper, they, they might become slightly offended. Uh, but that's what he was until God called him. And it's probably what each one of you were before God called you. And so he calls him. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I don't know about you, but I like directions. GPS, you know, an address, town, zip code, all of that. And the Lord said, I want you to leave everything and go to a place that I'll show you. Can I get a hint? Can I get a coordinate? Can I get an address? No, I'll take you to a land that I will show you. And so he marries and he heads out. And the Lord speaks to him while he's in Haran or Ur of the Chaldees, uh, which is basically a flat plain of, of nothingness. But between the two rivers is called Mesopotamia. That's the name of the area. And called him to go to Canaan. And so what he did is he packed up his father and his, cousin, and his uh, nephew and went upstream. As you can see on the map, Canaan is a little bit more to the west. It's like being called to California and going to North Dakota. <laughs> and he dragged along with him his aged father and his nephew. He didn't exactly do what God had told him to do, but he went in that direction. The, the amazing thing is in Hebrews, none of this is mentioned because as we know, looking back, and especially once people are gone, it's really hard to speak evil of them, right? Right? Did you ever go to a funeral and hear somebody spoken evil of? Well, that's too bad. Sorry to hear that. Uh, but they call it a eulogy because it's good words. It's actually supposed to be good U-E-U. Uh, never mind. A eulogy is good words. Just trust me on that. Uh, and it's not supposed to be bad words like, I'm, you know, I'm glad you're dead, all that kind of stuff. You, you know, that's not necessarily for that. But God takes our sins and he throws them as far as the east is from the, the west and he remembers them no more, right? Amen. And so in memorial, I'll be pleased, as I said before God, that he says, I don't remember one bad thing that you did. And it's not that I didn't do anything bad. It's that Jesus Christ died and took away the penalty and the guilt and the power of my sin. Amen? Amen. And so I've been changed from the inside out, which is God's plan, as opposed to me making myself better, which never seems to work out real well. So we've been looking at how God blessed him regardless of his obedience. He goes up and his father finally dies. And it's interesting how Jesus is the one who forgives our sin and he throws him as far as the east is from the west. We saw his obedience and then we look at the New Testament and see what Jesus actually requires to be a follower of his. He says, you have to leave everything and follow me, everything. 
In fact, he uses the words, take up your cross and follow me. And this is before he went to the cross. This is before he had died. I find that prophetic and interesting that Jesus says, we have to take up our cross, which means our plan, our aspirations, our lives are basically destroyed in place of doing God's will. That's what it is to be a Christian. And so he leaves and he takes stuff that he shouldn't be taking with him. Oh. Kind of like that. <laughs> we went over this two weeks ago, so you might not remember that. But yeah, you can hardly see the truck on the left. We tend to be collectors of things. I think Americans have invented the thing uh, called storage that you pay for somewhere else remotely that's inconvenient and gated uh, for you to be able to get into to go visit your stuff periodically yeah. as you pay someone to keep all the stuff that is decreasing in value all the time because you're having to pay for it to be there. Um, I, I hate storage. I wish it didn't exist. We might be a more giving people if that were the case. But anyway, he did not leave as God told him to leave, and he ends up dragging his dad with him, and dad ends up dying, and so now he can be obedient. But he drags Lot with him anyway. We see that that becomes a problem. So they finally go from Haran, and they go down to Shechem, into the land of Canaan, finally doing what God said, and there's actually a five-year lag in there where he doesn't quite get to where God wants him to be, but he gets there eventually. And aren't you glad that God has grace on us when we don't do exactly what he asks us to do exactly at the moment he tells us to do it. Yes. How many of you think God is just waiting to throw a lightning bolt at you just mess up one time, man? Just one more time. I feel that way sometimes. But that's not the heart of our God. That may have been my earthly father, but that's not my heavenly father. And it's not yours either. And so he goes by the, 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 into the land of Canaan and he finally makes it there. And he goes, and what does he do? Instead of building a city and setting up camp, he builds an altar, which we talked about last week. Altars are a place where you get altered. It's a place where you come before God and you make a sacrifice and you pray. I hope you guys have altars all over the place. I hope you have altars, not necessarily that you worship something on the altar, but you worship the God of heaven at the altar. And you can do that in your car. Certainly we've done it here. And you can do it at work. You could do it at your desk when your boss is, you know, leaning on you hard. And you just say, Lord, help me. <laughs> you build an altar. You make an altar and you cry out to God for help at that moment. Abraham builds altars or Abram builds altars all the time. Nahor, we see later in Genesis 20, someday we'll get there, that he's building cities. He's one of his relatives. And so he's a city builder and he's an earth dweller. Abraham is somebody who dwells in tents, but he builds altars, which are more permanent. And that points to God because there's a place in the time when God will come back for us. And so we talked about that. He camps out between Bethel and Ai, which uh, Bethel means house of God and Ai means heap of ruins. We're kind of all camped there. We're, we're just one step away from complete ruin and, and yet near God as well. So this week, we're going to talk about Lot. He drags Lot with him and what happens when they're in Canaan. He's going to be tempted. Here's the story in verse 10 of chapter 12. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for a famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass that when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. And so it was when Abraham came into Egypt that Egyptians saw the woman, and she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen and male donkeys and male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this thing that you have done to me? 
Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her, go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Abram, the man of faith, has a moment of weakness, and he decides lying is the way to go. In verse 10, now there was a famine in the land. Now, we don't know what a famine is here in New Jersey. Everything's green. We know what protected wetlands are. We know what swamp is. We know what summer in November is. <laughs> but you don't understand what famine is. Famine is when you don't have rain. Things don't grow. Animals die. Uh, they're having a whole bunch of, they're having problems in Africa right now. There are elephants and wildebeest and zebras dead everywhere because they're having one of the worst droughts in history. Right now, uh, the Mississippi River is a, like a trickle in some places because they've not gotten enough rain. That's about as far as it gets around here that we understand. But this was a great famine so that there's not enough food to eat. Uh, you think it's tough when COVID hit. You remember going to the store to look for meat? I have a picture of all the shelves completely empty and no toilet paper. <laughs> That's the worst famine I've experienced, I think. And yet, you know, you make do, right? Goodness sake. So there was a famine in the land. And so Abram, notice he doesn't pray and ask God, hey, what should I do about this? He just makes a decision. I'm going to Egypt to dwell there. And the famine was severe in the land. Egypt is a place where they have the Nile River. And it's this wonderful area of the Fertile Crescent where there, there's lots of greenery and lots of things grow there. So even if you don't have a lot of rain and if things are going difficult, there's always water in the Nile. And so the, he decided all on his own to go to Egypt. And you'd say, Pastor Dave, that's a rather practical measure. Would you rather him die with his family and all of his crops and everything? Just die in the wilderness? Well, it'd be okay, except the Bible always uses Egypt as a picture of the world, as a picture of a place you shouldn't go, not a good place. So they go, and you can imagine being an older man, you know how you collect stuff over the years, and now you got to pack it up and go. So he packs up everything and goes because of the famine. Isaiah 31.1 demonstrates my picture. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. The prophet Isaiah says, woe to them. In other words, boy, it's, it's gonna suck to be you if you do this and you go to Egypt. I can tell you, if you move from New Jersey and you find the perfect town, you will ruin it. <laughs> there are lots of people from New Jersey moving down south. Have you known this? Do you have a plan? You have your travel log. Yeah, there are a lot of people moving down south. Guess what? All the taxes are going up. All the prices of houses are going up. All the prices of everything are going up south of here because of you people. <laughs> we have a house right next door to our church here. It went up for sale. It sold in three days. It's a nice little place for $357,000. Yeah! Right? Guess what? If there's famine, there's going to be famine everywhere. And Deciding that you're going to partake in the world doesn't necessarily take care of your problem. That's like Pastor Dave saying, well, listen, I can make more money not being a pastor than dealing with you people. <laughs> Whatever your Egypt is, there's always a temptation to take a shortcut, to find the easy route, you know, the easy money quick. Oh, did you know that the Powerball is up to a, a world-breaking record? Yeah. Oh, some of you know this. I have never lost at the lottery. There is always the looming temptation to trust our wits and strength rather than trust God at his word. Always. The temptation is going to be, 
Can you trust the Lord with whatever thing it is that you're dealing with? Can you trust him? Can I trust the Lord that at some point I'm going to be on a fixed income? Can I trust the Lord that at some point the doctor's going to give me bad news? Can I trust the Lord to, to tithe, to give, to do for other people instead of myself? I mean, what if, what if I need that stuff? I can't give that away. I can't empty my storage facility, Pastor Dave. I might need that stuff. Listen, I, I have so many saws, I don't even know what to do with them. If you need a saw, come and see me. I've given some away, I'll give some more. There's always a looming temptation to trust in our own wits and our own strength, and it reveals itself in, in weird ways, right? Like hoarding is a result of wanting security and stuff. You're all silent, as though I'm speaking to a room full of hoarders. Just because you have stuff doesn't mean it's good. And we'll see that by the time, I got to get it. I got to get on this instead of being mad at myself. <laughs> Verse 11, it came to pass that when he was close to entering Egypt, as he's running away from the promised land, which God called him to, and it got a little tough and he decided to leave, that he said to Sarai, his wife, indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. <laughs> oh, thank you, dear. <laughs> I can see that conversation, right? <laughs> Honey, you are a fox. Therefore, it will happen. He's prophesying. It will happen when Egyptians see you that they will say, this is my wife and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may go well with me for your sake and that I may live because of you. No comment. Okay. <laughs> Honey, we're on, our, we're on our way to Egypt, okay? You're hot. You are absolutely hot. That's why I chose you, by the way. Her name means contentious. So he didn't choose her because of her name. Now listen, they're going to take one look at you, and these guys have no problem with killing me and taking you. So you know. So you have to lie for God to protect me. After all, he gave me a promise and everything. Kind of important. I better not find out that any of you have had anything go on like this. Because I think, what a spineless, faithless, weak man. Hey, honey, could you protect me? Just lie for me, please. And it's funny, this is one of those true falsehoods. This is a situation where she actually is his half-sister. So it's, you know, half the truth is not the truth, right? right no. you, you can still be deceptive and tell the truth, as long as it's not the whole truth. So your truth could be a lie. If you're confused, we'll talk later. <laughs> Compromising the truth will lead to complicated entanglements that you cannot predict. Be careful if you wish to deceive, if you think you've got a lie to protect your own skin or you're worried about what people think or whatever might be going through your mind, don't do it. It's better to be honest and, and take it on the chin, whatever's coming, just be honest because God will be with you at that point. If you lie, you will be against him and he will find you out. So, this may seem like a momentary lack of judgment on Abram's heart, but he does this three times. He does the same thing. He goes to Egypt, says, say you're my sister, to Pharaoh three times. And Pharaoh says, hey, you're kind of hot. I don't have one of your kind. And I'm trying to gather one of every kind, like baseball cards. He does this three times. This is not a momentary lapse. This is a, this is a fatal flaw in his character. Yeah. And it comes from fear, doesn't it? Yeah. A lot of us will do all kinds of things for fear. And it will, it will color your entire life. He does this three times. The fearful faithlessness of, and is fearful, is fearful. I, I knew I shouldn't have written it with alliteration. The fearful faithlessness in God 
and his promises is a failure that God will need to intervene to help Abram. And, and you'll see in chapter 20, verse 2 and 26, verse 7, those are the two other times where he does this very same thing and he asks his wife to lie. Men, don't ask your wife to lie. <laughs> Ladies, don't ask your men to lie. In fact, don't lie. Just be honest. Or live your life in such a way that you can be 100% honest and it's okay. That's the trick. So why doesn't Abram trust God here? We could talk about theories later, psychological analyzation of Abram and his background, perhaps his parentage, whatever it is. But my question is, I don't know. Why don't we? Why don't we trust God at his word? It's easy to sit in judgment on Abram. But, you know, you could have a big old log hanging out of your eye while you're trying to pull a speck out of his. Why don't we believe God? Why can't we trust God when it gets difficult, when it gets hard? I can, I can remember waking up a few years ago, and I, I woke up because I couldn't breathe for some reason. I think it was sleeping on my face, which is not good. <laughs> and I woke up and went, oh, I have COVID. <laughs> and I thought for sure I was going to die. And then I said, oh, I was sleeping on my face. <laughs> Evidenced by the three wet spots on the, t on the pillow. So I, I knew it wasn't good. But we tend to go to the worst case scenario in our minds, don't we? Like, oh no, there's a phone, phone call. I don't know who that is. Oh no, it's bad news. I just know it. Some of us, that's what we do. We just assume the worst. Or I haven't heard from this person in a long time. I wonder what happened. Oh no. Right? Don't you do that? Yeah. Eh, you, you're good people. I do that sometimes. <clears throat> Listen, Abram does this three times. There's no pass or fail in God's classroom. It's only pass or repeat. He was tested, found to be weak, went about his business. He comes back, does the same thing twice. So he has to come back a third time because God doesn't have a pass or fail grade sheet. Wouldn't that be nice? He's got a pass or you have to do it over. You ever wonder why you keep getting into the same thing? Because you haven't learned the thing you're supposed to learn in that thing yet. It happens. It happens. Sometimes we make the same stupid mistakes and you hate yourself for it. You haven't learned what you need to learn. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. Beauty has a, a rare effect on people, doesn't it? The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. Now, who are the princes? <clears throat> if you have a king and you have princes, who are the princes? They're the sons of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's sons say, hey, she'd make a nice new mom. That's a little twisted, isn't it? Hey, hey, dad, she's awesome. You should pick her up. You should date her. You should go out and you should go to dinner. What, are you kidding me? I mean, how does that go? You know, one of the sisters goes up and says, hi, nice to meet you, Sarai. Um, these are my brothers, and they'd like to meet you because you're like so awesome and foxy and everything. And how do you get your skin to be like that? You know, I could just see the whole conversation trying to get to know her and maybe fix her up with the princess, but the princess go back to Pharaoh and say, she's a knockout, man. You should really check her out, which is a little scary yeah. if you have a culture like that. And the funny thing is, they didn't have a problem with murder. And then suddenly, she becomes almost like property, and you can inherit her, like a prize for killing her husband. But they had a real problem with adultery. They had no problem killing someone, but adultery was completely off the books. And if this is really her brother, they got to negotiate. Because you got you to pay the man for the loss of this beautiful woman. And the larger the dowry, the more she's valued. Do you see, that's how the way it used to work. Now, I know maybe when you were dating, it, you didn't have that whole economic system, and perhaps you're lucky for that. 
I didn't have to pay nothing to get my wife. <laughs> but it doesn't make her worthless. I have brought you a goat. <laughs> I was poor. You know, I didn't even have a goat. Physical beauty can be a distraction to truly seeing someone's soul. You know, when you, look at, when you look at the outside of somebody and they're beautiful, you can be captivated by that and completely miss the fact that there's a soul, an eternal soul, a real person with feelings and emotions and thoughts and ideas and a soul, which is the whole modeling industry is completely messed up because it makes people devoid of souls. And all you do is look at the physical. I always wondered why all the models seem angry. <laughs> They're angry. They're always angry. Because, see, there's no emotion. There's no soul. There's no person in there. You're just looking at a shell. And that's what they sell. Anyway, so I got to thinking about physical beauty and how in some places they display it differently. In fact, in Africa, they do this thing where they plate their lips. They, yeah, the, 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 the ladies especially, they, they plate them and they put them out. And, and it's caught on here in America because apparently it makes kissing so much easier. <laughs> what ends up happening is the, the lip actually parts from your jaw and it ends up being a giant rubber band. And uh, this, is, this is attractive to some, especially whatever it is that she did with her hair there. Uh, so beauty is a, it's a strange thing, you know. It, it's really in the eye of the beholder, as it is said, right? <clears throat> I mean, it's like a very small basketball hoop. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how that's, well, I, I don't think she's supposed to talk in this culture, and that may be part of it, uh, why it's desirable, but it, it's an amazing thing, and it doesn't matter where you go. Everybody has their thing. Like a long neck actually is, is perceived as, as something that's attractive, and they have places where they put rings on the neck, and they actually stretch the neck. Well, if you're a chiropractor, and I know you are, Steve, there's no way you can stretch your neck. What ends up happening is you push your shoulders down, and your shoulders just go further and further down your vertebrae so that your shoulders look like this and your neck appears to be longer. You're just exposing vertebrae that once were between your shoulder blades. And this is, consider this is considered beautiful. So I don't want to start anything. <laughs> but beauty is a funny thing. Yeah, there's a Mursai woman uh, who's uh, down in Africa and... She's, she's got more stuff on than I think I could afford to buy. <laughs> and tattoos on the body and all of these things. And, you know, there are way worse things that I could show you in America where people who are just dissatisfied and uncomfortable with who they are feel they need to radically change their body like God did a terrible job putting me together. And I'm going to have to take charge here and make sure everything looks better. Now, in China, what is valued, at least in the past, has been small feet. Some of you might have a foot fetish. You might hate feet, or you might love feet. But small feet were actually the thing that was looked to to be beautiful. And they call this binding. What they would do is they would bind up their foot, and supposedly it would inhibit the growth of your foot so that your feet would not grow large. I mean... Can you imagine seeing a beautiful woman and then, you know, she's got a size 13? That's curious. You wonder what your children might be like. But that was considered a beautiful thing. And that picture kind of really shows you what it is. It's, it's called the lotus foot. And it's come by binding your foot. And so that you can get into a shoe that looks like a lotus flower, which is rather interesting. But what you don't know is that this is what happens to your foot. Your toes curl under your big toe, and it becomes this interesting, deformed thing. And this is considered beautiful, like women wearing heels this high. Oh, no, it's completely different, Pastor Day. 
Tell me you're not uncomfortable at the end of the day. Anyway, so that's, that's what it does. I'd rather slip into that kind of lotus <laughs> rather than that kind of lotus. But it's interesting because beauty can become very distracting. It can become an all-consuming pursuit of perfection. Be careful. And it happens to men. It happens to women. And the way that you think you'll be perceived can be a distraction. Anyway, sorry to go off in that direction. Somebody who's an example of this would be Michael Jackson. Here's a picture of what he once looked like without surgery. And of course, if your skin is too dark, you've got to make it lighter. If your skin's too light, you've got to make it darker. Whatever it is that you don't have, that's the thing that you want. Isn't that the sin nature? You tell a child, you cannot eat broccoli. You're not eating broccoli. You're eating broccoli? Yep, I'm going to eat it all. Oh, that's the way we work. That's called reverse psychology. Don't try it. It doesn't work for long. But people do crazy things like tan to the point of skin cancer or have surgery to the point where they're losing body parts with infection and everything else. Or you don't feel that you're attractive enough to your mate. This poor woman, her husband really liked cats and thought she kind of looked like a cat, but not enough. And so surgeries. People are obsessed with perfection. And this is what ends up happening with beauty. I mean, I, I, I like a woman who has lips, just not out to here or, you know, inflated. You know, you got to go to the quick check and get free air in them or something. I, you, know. you see this. It's, it's an abnormal obsession with beauty. But it's a, it's a misperception. And you wonder, do they have people that love them that talk to them and say, yo, enough. We so wish to be loved. And this is just a distraction. Because it doesn't bring real love. It brings distraction. Right? Like this guy. Handsome young man turned himself into a Ken doll. It's... It is a crazy world. And so physical beauty can be a distraction to truly seeing someone's soul. And we tend to be repulsed by people we don't understand or think they've done crazy things, but you know they need Jesus. Because the love of God <coughs> takes away all of that misgiving. Because now, you're, now you know you're loved. You're loved by an eternal God who sent his son to die for you. What more could you want? And it doesn't matter what you look like or how big your feet are. This is what the scripture says in the New Testament. 1 Peter 3, verses 3 to 6. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. This is a word to women, by the way, uh, but it could apply to the metrosexual male. Arranging of the hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible, because by the way, all the rest of this stuff goes away, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For the, in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah. Where did Sarah's beauty come from? the inside. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. The New Testament attributes the beauty of Sarah to her spirit, not her face. Isn't that amazing? And you will be her daughters if you don't give way to any fear, any terror. So the scripture says, it should be the inside that radiates from a human being, not the outside that covers up an insecure human being. The woman was taken to Pharaoh's house just like that. She literally got picked up. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep and oxen, male donkeys and male and female servants, 
female donkeys and camels. So, ding dong, who's at the door? Oh, Amazon. Cool. What is it? Oh my goodness, the whole street is filled with animals and people. What are these? Oh, it's a gift from Pharaoh. He took your sister. What? You mean Sarai? Yeah, that one. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. I hit the jackpot. <laughs> Took that contentious woman away and gave me all this stuff. Not really. And whose fault is it that this happened? Abram. Abram's fault. Because he lied. Things get very complicated. It's like, let's make a deal. It's like Monty Hall. You know, you can, you can trade what's in this box for what... The, the curtain behind which Carol Merrill's standing. Some of you old people know that. <laughs> and you make a deal. Except he was forced into this deal, wasn't he? Because Pharaoh took her. He just took her. Because men of power, that's what they do. They just take stuff. But yeah, but look at this beautiful camel. I mean, it's a two-humper, man. That's a... Uh... So suddenly there's a conflict of values and it's now being challenged. Hey, you really like lion? By the way, your wife is gone and has been replaced by a bunch of animals and servants. Because you lied. And you would think it would just take him one time to remember, oh my goodness, I better not say she's my sister ever, ever, ever again. Imagine how he felt. Sarai's gone and it's because I lied. Man, I don't know if you carry guilt like I do but I would feel like a miserable, worthless piece of garbage that doesn't deserve to live another day. And it's all on him, the man of faith, Abraham. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh <laughs> because Abram's not the only one defending her. And his house with great plagues because of Sarai's, Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. So apparently they didn't seal the deal. Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. I don't think he said it in a nice way. Plagues. Suddenly he takes this woman into his house and plagues. It's interesting, it doesn't tell you what the plagues are. But this sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. God steps in to protect Sarai where Abram wouldn't. Ladies, I don't know who you got at home for a man. But I can tell you, your heavenly father is way better than him. Right, baby? She reluctantly nods. I like that. The truth in love. First of all, you have captivity because she was taken. Number two, you have plagues. Number three, you have a release. And number four, you have an exodus. Doesn't that sound familiar? It reminds me of Yul Brynner. So let it be written. So let it be done. It's the same exact, it's the same exact thing that happened. Now, it's interesting because Abram is the father of the Jewish nation. The Jews become slaves in Egypt they have all of these plagues that come and eventually Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt, by the way, that's not his name, that's his position. That's like the president, you know, the POTUS. He says, you know, you, you guys need to get the heck out of here because I, I can't handle this. And then they leave. It's interesting. It's almost like they're acting out the same thing that's going to happen later because God works the same throughout time. And there are pictures and shadows that all the time the Lord is trying to speak to us and teach us. I know that you can trust God, even if nobody else will defend you. In Numbers chapter 32, interesting, um, this is Moses speaking to the people and telling them they need to, to get busy to, to go and take the land. But he says, if you do not do so, then take note that you have sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. That's like a scary verse. 
Just know that your sin will find you out as though you produced it and decided to create this thing and it's going to hunt you down. It's a little like, you know, taking care of an alligator in your home. <coughs> Just know this pet thing that you fed and took care of and made sure is here is going to bite you. It will find you out. It always does. That's why God implores us not to do it. So I learned if you don't talk to God about your sin, he might tell someone else. <laughs> if you don't talk to God about your sins, maybe, maybe he'll tell somebody else and they'll come tell you. You know how uncomfortable that is? I've been caught at some things, and I hate that. Any of you like that feeling? Oh, oh, I'm caught. I did something I shouldn't have done, and oh, now it's known. I hate that, because I can't even blame anybody. It's my fault. It's interesting. If you don't talk to God about it and deal with it, he may talk to somebody else, because look, Pharaoh finds out, and he goes, why don't you tell me this was your wife? Who told him? It's interesting. We find out later with one of the other Pharaohs, the Lord tells him. Because the Pharaoh cries out to God and he says, God, what's going on? Here's an ungodly, non-regenerate human being. He's crying out to God in his hour of weakness and God speaks to him because Abram's not listening. Deal, deal with your stuff before the Lord steps in and tells somebody else. In verse 20, and now Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> thinking, wow, rent out my wife for a night. She wasn't defiled or anything, and I get her back and get to keep all the stuff. He just said, go away. And suddenly, Abram has all of this stuff. Given him as a gift, but now it's more of a parting gift than it is a wedding gift. Some of you might think that's a good idea. The scripture says in Mark chapter 8, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus said that. What will you give in exchange for your soul? What's your number? And of course, if, if you're interested in popular psychology, they say everyone has a number. It's been the makings of many movies. Everybody's got a number makings of many stories in the Bible. Now that he has all this stuff, he's got to live with his wife who lied for him and was almost violated by the Pharaoh of Egypt. It's interesting because God made a promise. And without Sarai in the mix, the promise isn't going to happen, is it? It's the promise that there would be a Messiah that would come one day and he would break the power of sin who we know to be Jesus Christ. And God had to step in and preserve Sarai because God's got some stake in this. So, all the animals and all the people that he has now are going to present problems. We're going to see next week, we start talking about he and Lot, they've got so much stuff, there's not enough land for them. We're going to see a little bit later that Sarai, because she's not able to have children, says, hey, listen, I got an idea. Why don't you sleep with this young slave woman that we got in Egypt? And when she has a child, it'll be like ours. So it'll be like an interesting adoption. And Abram said, okay. <laughs> they wouldn't have Hagar if they didn't go to Egypt. They wouldn't have had an argument about the land and all their stuff had they not gone to Egypt. All of the stuff that he carries with him are, is now going to be the source of a lot of problem, not the jackpot. The true challenge of possessions is not to be possessed by them. I mean, stuff is good and stuff is a necessary tool so that we can get through our lives and pay our bills. But if you're living for stuff, stuff's going to let you down because it will take away your life. The true challenge of people is not to be controlled by them. You see, he was so worried about Pharaoh's opinion 
of himself or that his life might get sacrificed, that he was willing to lie. He was willing to do dirty on God to save his own skin. Guys, it always comes down to a choice. And I think every time we're faced with it, the question is, are you going to worry about people or are you trying to please God? Are you trying to please people or are you trying to please God? Nothing wrong with making somebody happy as long as you're doing what God told you to do. But if somebody else's happiness is more important than doing what God wants you to do, you've got things switched around. And the true challenge of hardship is learning to endure it. I don't know what his choices were about going to Egypt or not. But sometimes we, we hit a brick wall and we find a difficult thing and we just figure, ah, I'll go around it. I'll go over it. I'll go under it. I'll, I'll figure something out. You know, I'll, I'll make this happen. I'll, I'll shuffle some things and even if I have to lie. It's a real temptation when we have difficulties to run away to a place like Egypt. And yet, we see it didn't work so well for Abram, and it doesn't work out the other two times he goes. And you would think, now we all have learned this lesson, now we'll never do that. We'll always do the tough thing, and we'll face it head on, and you know, we'll go to the Lord instead of trying to run away and find an escape. But some of us, as has been my history, make it a, a lifelong pursuit of avoidance. Yeah, I, I know I got to do this thing, but I, I can't think about it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. Oh, I know I need to call somebody. I know I need to call that. Uh, but I'll call them tomorrow. Well, why don't you put a note in your phone? No, it's all right. I'll remember. Like you've been remembering for the last three weeks? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just, you know. And we just avoid stuff, right? Avoidance is just putting off a decision. That's what it is. So, next week, tune in, because we're going to talk about how Lot, Lot finally launches. The nephew in which he's been carrying on his back and has caused him no trouble up to this point, he now says, we can't live together anymore. And you know how it is when you, you have a roommate that <laughs> won't move on. It comes the time for it to move on, and Abram shows us some extraordinary grace and how to do it. And so we'll look at that next week. That, that's all now. <laughs> As the worship team comes up, I hope that we're all learning together some important lessons from the, the Word of God, how God deals with us, and how patient he was with Abram, and how Abram is still a hero of the faith. He's still a guy that believes God. And in spite of him, God blesses him. Isn't that amazing? In spite of you, God can bless you. Don't think you have to be worthy enough because you'll never get there. Don't think you need to be good enough because you never will be not without submitting your life to him. Amen.